All right, y'all all know the deal. We're recording now, so you've lost your chance to share your bank account numbers, the social security numbers. Welcome to the Classes for the Curious Musician. I'm so glad you're all here. I'm gonna try and keep letting people in as we talk for a quick second. If you're new to this, I am Anna Huthmaker from Huthmaker Violins. And we started this because we noticed that COVID had taken away so many of the musical opportunities for the adult amateurs we knew. Their concerts were canceled, their rehearsals were canceled, their camps were canceled. And um, and we just thought, we gotta do something, you know? And this is our second series of eight classes. We have two more after tonight. Um, for our regular folks, I'm so glad you guys are here. Now, I know my camera says, or my picture says Dixie Hethmaker. I'm Anna, actually, because I stole my mom's Zoom. My The one that says Buddy Hethmaker is actually my mom sitting there. We're the Hethmaker family. Um, so just a couple of little housekeeping things. I will, I am recording it. I will put it on YouTube, the Hethmaker Violins YouTube channel. Should be up sometime tomorrow afternoon if I get the, get it all taken care of. Um, but And I will post it on our Facebook page so that you can share it with your friends that weren't able to make the live one. Um, so we have, we've got a great crowd, though. You guys are awesome. I'm keeping you all muted for the time being so that um, we don't have background noise. If you see anything technically wrong, shoot it in the chat box because, you know, I'm not that technologically advanced. So one more thing. Um, I... So I start this every week and I tell you guys, those of you guys who are regular, you know this. I always say that my favorite part about doing these, this series is that I get to introduce you to all my favorite people in the world, my friends, um, my teachers, the people that I really know and wanna share with y'all. Tonight is the first time you're meeting our clinician at the same time I am. So he's pretty famous. <laughs> And this is what happened. I, what happened was I was running through the shop a few weeks back and I said, I really want to do a class on vibrato. Who can teach vibrato? And my mom handed up, handed the Asta or held up the Asta magazine. And she went, well, look at this guy. And I looked at it and I read it and, and, and I went, he is way too big time. He is not going to come do my class. And she said, you should email him and try. And I did. And he has just been so generous and so graceful and said yes. So um, I want to introduce you all to William Herzog. Did I say it right, William? Excellent. Yeah, no, Excellent. It's, it's German five generations ago, but it's all anglicized and Americanized. Yeah. Well, as a Huthmaker dash Hootmacher, I understand um, that completely. So um, he is a world famous soloist. He's played with everyone you can imagine. He teaches, he's a guest lecturer at colleges and all over the place. You should go check out his website when we're done. It's really great. And, um, and I am so glad you're here tonight. We're gonna do things. So he is gonna do his thing put your questions in the chat, but unless it's something earth shaking, we have to deal with right then. And, and he'll make that dis decision because he he's good at this, so he can do the chat also. Then we'll at the end do a question and answer. So does that work for everybody? Say yes, I hope it does. <laughs> so, You're I, good, so you can't protest. <laughs> <laughs> I know, seriously. So um, I am going to mute myself and turn this over. Thank you, thank you, thank you, William. We appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thank you for that introduction, Anna. Anna Dixie. Anna. Yes. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I, I wrote this article in, in in the ASTA Journal, the American String Teachers Association Journal, which was very kind of apropos because it's it's COVID time. So anything anybody doing anything successfully virtually is is uh, is rather uh, valuable at the moment. So that was my little contribution. So let me just give you a quick layout of what we'll do tonight, and then we'll dive right in. Um, we're going to talk about what is vibrato, talk a little teensy weensy bit about physics because it's not really my field, and I'm going to play a little bit of music for you, give you a feeling for what kind of what vibrato is. You probably already know that. So just brief interview introduction, and then we are going to talk about basically how to learn vibrato. I mean, there's, there's three preparatory checkpoints, three preparatory exercises, and then eight 
a series of eight exercises. I'm the kind of person that takes things and breaks them down into little tiny pieces so that hopefully everybody can really succeed at doing it. That's kind of, that's the idea. And we're going to work through some things together in terms of working on vibrato. And at the very, very end, we're going to talk about some kind of more expressive vibrato land ideas. And we're going to work on a little piece of music. So let's start off. Let me, you know, heard a little bit about me. I don't know that I'm quite so famous as, as all that, but I, I teach in, I'm, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. I teach in Northern Kentucky. If you don't know your geography, which I didn't until I got the job, that's actually very, very close together. Um, so even though I live on the north side of Cincinnati and I work in Kentucky, I have a 25 minute commute, which is not really very bad at all. Um, so, and before that I was in Baltimore and then Eastman before that, and I've been to Northwestern, Indiana University. I've been, I was very happy actually to come back to the Midwest. I kind of love the Midwest, even though I'm Canadian, but I fell in love with the Midwest. And so here I am. Who is in the room or room with me? So can I have um, like either a hand, you can do like the hand up or you can do like the hand, like that sort of thing in your chat uh, down by reactions. You can like clap or put the thumbs up or like a heart. Who are my violinists in the room? Room. Yeah, physical hand raises. Ooh, we got lots of violins. Yeah, violin. No bias whatsoever. Who are my violists in the room? I am also a violist, so I'm going to put my hand up there as well. Yay! Do I have any any floor any floor instruments? Bass and cello. Oh, we got some we got some floor floor instruments. I call them sh shoulder instruments and floor instruments because that's that's kind of how we break down. So I'm also sort of a cellist, but much worse than the violin. So I'm mostly going to be talking in a shoulder instrument style. Um, and is maybe going to jump in occasionally and help me out with some uh, analogies to the floor instruments as well. So when we're talking about vibrato, what is vibrato? It's not unique to string instruments, although certainly string instruments, we love it. Vibrato is when you take a pitch, a pitch is basically a wave, a pressure wave going through the air, which is much more complicated than just the regular wave we're used to seeing, but we'll just forget about that for now. And if the wave is more dense with more peaks and troughs, it's going faster, that gives us a higher pitch. And if the waves are going slower, that gives us a lower pitch, right? We all, basic stuff that we know. Vibrato, when we change pitches, we're actually changing the frequency of the oscillation significantly. Vibrato, you change it just a little bit up and a little bit down, but fairly rapidly. So on the violin, the way that we change pitches is we place the finger on the string, and then if I roll the finger up slightly, it's gonna make the pitch go up slightly. If I roll it down slightly, it's gonna make the pitch go down slightly. So, and we do that essentially in rapid, uh, rapid succession. So a non-vibrated note's gonna sound, whereas vibrato's gonna sound. And you can see in order to make that work, let me just change my camera. I'm on, this is how you talk at a meeting. This is how you talk when you're playing the violin. Okay, there's actually quite a bit of machinery and mechanics going on in order to make that work, which is what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start off by playing just a little, I'm going to play Meditation from Thais, very famous, with no vibrato and then with vibrato. Just a word here, by the way, for all that vibrato is amazing, the primary expressive engine is this hand, not this hand. This hand adds color and lovely things but without expression in the right hand, things like dynamics, articulation, the vibrato doesn't help that much. However, that being said, let's play a little bit of Thais with no vibrato. I will do my best to play it very, very beautifully. Thank you. 
All right, cool. So obviously vibrato helps a lot. I'm also doing a presentation on vibrato. So I'm really thinking about lots of colors in the vibrato. <coughs> All right, the easiest way to vibrate, to create vibrato, is of course through tension. I don't know who my Star Wars people are, are out there, but if you are, you'll get this one. For once you start down the dark path of tension, forever will it dominate your vibrato destiny, right? And let's go ahead and just try that. Basically, tension means that like, if I'm like flexing this muscle and that muscle, my arm will just kind of, like if you make your whole body, you'll just kind of go, you can kind of get your hands to shake. Don't do this, it's gonna hurt you, but you can feel if you really, really tense up, everything will shake, right? You can create a shake. Go ahead and try that. Tense yourself up a lot. I mean, don't hurt yourself, but tense yourself up and you'll find that things actually shake a little bit, right? They actually shake as a result of that tension. And a lot of people, when they're looking for the, the quick path towards vibrato, sorry, I'm gonna take it easy on the, on the Yoda references here, but you just kind of tense up and you get a vibrato. That is vibrato. In terms of the definition of vibrato, that is vibrato. However, the trouble with that approach First off, it hurts. <laughs> Ow. Second, it, there's no real possibility for variation. And much of what makes vibrato beautiful is, is variability. And if you're tense like that, things like shifting, crossing strings, changing finger patterns, all those things are going to be a hassle and a half. So we want to avoid tension. We don't want to, we're kind of, relax is kind of a bad word nowadays, because like, I'm going to relax, you just kind of fall on the floor and in a heap, right? You actually have to, in order to, I mean, I'm standing, in order to stand, there's a lot of muscle engagement just to be holding yourself upright. So we don't want to completely relax, but we don't want to introduce any additional tension. So I'm going to use the term tension-free from here on. So we want to have tension-free, no extra tension. And the way that we're going to do that and get a vibrato is to take motions you already know how to do, right? One of the biggest things when people play the violin, right? They have a lot of trouble getting to the frog, right? You know, nobody likes playing at the frog. So like, go from the tip to the frog. And someone stops there and you're like, go to the frog. And you're like, you know, and people don't want to do that. One of my favorite things to do for that is just say, put your hand on your shoulder. Good, that's your frog, right? Go ahead and do a try that. Put your hand on your shoulder. Welcome to the frog. Reach out and tap your computer. Welcome to the tip. I know there's bow hand issues and flexibility that have to go into actually making it this natural, but there's no actual large, there's no large motion problem. And similarly with vibrato, you're able to oscillate back and forth because there are certain things you do in your life that are similar to that, that we can, that you would never put a ton of tension into because why? And so we're going to learn from that. So the first thing I want you to do, if you have an instrument handy, go ahead and and pick it up. We're gonna do just a kind of a pre-launch checklist, three things you wanna make sure, ah yes, three things you wanna make sure that you, three things you wanna make sure that you are kind of doing correctly before we get started. The first one, as you have your instrument up, you wanna make sure you can do hands-free um, and that you are in a generally balanced posture, right? We don't wanna be <clears throat> upright, but balanced meaning the weight is equally distributed between my legs, my head isn't, you know, doing anything kind of weird or wacko like this, right? Generally, a balanced posture. The second thing is the actual way your hand is... So go ahead and just check that. I'm going to kind of just look it through here. I assume most people are in a generally pretty balanced po posture. Looks good, Miriam. Looks good, Vidya. Vidya's already vibrating. It's way ahead of me over here. So we have this kind of balanced posture. And then hand position, you know, we have this kind of... You want to have these curly fingers. They're falling in a consistently rounded position, not a whole lot of this or this or kind of wacko things like this. And the third one is finger patterns. You want to be able to play this kind of regular, the, the regular, the one we all start with, with this. And then that low two or the high three, right? You can do the all these finger patterns. You want to make sure that you're able to play in G major, in A major, in E major with some comfort without you know having to, for that high three, kind of do anything to, you know, I, I'm very good at exaggerating because I have students, so I have to exaggerate with them. Um, but you want to make sure that you're able to do those things with a lot of comfort, because otherwise vibrato, it's, you know, you're, you're introducing a gentle, a gentle jiggle. And if, you know, if the, I don't know, insert your analogy here. If your floor, if you haven't got, you know, a stable foundation, don't put a washing machine on top of it. The whole house is going to fall down, right? So we're introducing a gentle jiggle on top of a, of a stable foundation. 
So before we actually start the vibrato exercises, there's a couple of motions that I want to introduce to you. And this is finger taps. So hopefully this was one of your very first things that you did. We're going to take the, your hand up to kind of like a nice, comfortable third position-ish. Um, Chelly bass is going to be kind of, you know, just resting at the neck, basically. And we're just going to tap the, thing, the string. I like my second finger. My second finger is my favorite finger. We're going to have that kind of percussive sound, but not... This is, again, we come back to not excess attention. I'm not, I'm not murdering the violin over here. You know, the violin didn't call me any bad names. At least not today. <laughs> right? And now we're going to try it in a rhythm. Switch fingers. Let's go with um, Mississippi Hot Dog. Mississippi Hot Dog. Mississippi Hot Dog. Mississippi Hot Dog. You'll notice I'm going to cut off my head in the screen here because I want to get you my arm. But I have a lot of nothing going on down here. It's just the hand. Very percussive. Right? So after we've done that a couple of times, we're going to switch to finger taps with magic glue. Finger taps with magic glue is I'm going to tap this, the fingerboard, but the magic is the glue sticks to the string, but not to the fingerboard. So instead of lifting all the way up, I'm now bouncing on the string. Maybe I'll do it on G string so it's easier to see. I'm bouncing the string, but I'm unable to exit the string, although with the fingerboard I'm exiting. Show me that. Let's do I, Mississippi Hot Dog. Little, 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 long, long, whatever your words happen to be. Hamburger and pickle or something, right? Everyone's pretty happy with that? Good. So another exercise, and this is one that is not for everybody, but it's only if necessary. A word about the mechanics of vibrato. You can have the most gorgeous, lovely looking arm situation. In the end, all that motion, it's transferred into the string. Mm, sorry, I'm trying to get you the best angle here. All that motion is transferred into the string through this knuckle. If this knuckle is stiff, nothing happens because the fingertip needs to remain steady. If I'm actually moving my whole finger up and down, it's going to be not good. Um, so all that motion has to transfer through the pulsing of this finger. So one exercise you can do if you're having some trouble with that first knuckle is you can go ahead and take that knuckle and just gently collapse and uncollapse. Gentle is the word here. This is a stretch. We're opening the joint. Nobody sees a ballet dancer stretching and going like, <gasps> right there. Everything, I'm not a ballet dancer, but you forgive me, but everything is gentle, is with breath, is acknowledging the limits of their body and just requesting that they go just a drop farther today. That's it. That's all you ask from your body. So let's do the second finger. Just gently, for me, I have a pretty full range of motion because, you know, I did this a lot back in third year of college or whenever I was forced to do it. Um, so just gently allowing that knuckle to collapse. And whether you're, I see uh, Gloria is initiating the mo motion from the elbow, that's perfectly fine. I like just kind of leaving everything else st still except for the hand, but if you want to do it with your arm, that's fine. If you want to do it with the wrist, that's fine too. You can do that with all the fingers. Typically, the fourth finger is kind of a tricky one to do that with because the fourth finger kind of wants to either go on or off. But if you can gently move through that motion so that you, there's, a, there's a complete motion, it's not just like here and then collapsed, right? Good morning. Uh, good evening, Eric. He's in the chat. Very nice. Okay. So, and that exercise is really something that you want to use as a kind of, it, you would use it in a diagnostic, sorry, I cut my head off, in a diagnostic sense. If you, everything is working well, and there's still, yeah, pinky collapses. Marie, this is, this is, this is life. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, to a certain extent, I don't know what to tell you. It's, you know, I, professional violinists that are sitting there with their pinky going like, come on, baby, come on, be there for me today. Um, so it's, it, it is a lot of patience with this and also realizing that if it's not perfect, it's still fine, basically. Um, this one you're going to introduce if everything is going well, but this vibrato sounds still very condensed and, and not lush then you want to come back and revisit this exercise. Um, good. Does anybody not have the handout, by the way? Because the handout was dropped in the chat a while ago, and it looks like there's some new people since then. I'm going to drop that in the chat again. It's basically just just a quick, you know, quick bulleted list of all the exercises. So if you want to kind of take your own notes, that's great. But it's mostly just there to remind you of what we did after the fact. Okay, now we get to the actual vibrato method. I want to take a, method, a minute because I, I do, I am a chatty, a chatty individual. Um, 
Does anybody have any questions that are, that are on their mind now before we kind of, we're turning a corner in terms of what we're doing? We've gone from one section to another major section. Does anybody have a question about what we've covered so far? Yes, absolutely. You, I'm sorry, yes, Marie, you can ask pedagogy questions, sure. Was that the whole question or is there, is there a follow-up pedagogy question? <laughs> um, there we go. Roughly how long should we expect a student to be working on these exercises? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, so I think that the once you're through the kind of everything's balanced and in the right spot, and then you are to the point of, you know, the preparatory exercises, I kind of like to introduce those. The reason why I call them preparatory, I don't think that they're absolutely indispensable. And usually when I'm teaching, I'm doing it kind of early with the students before I really think they're ready for vibrato, just to get them kind of used to the idea of something like this. Um, but after that point, um, I think about one exercise per week ish, very heavy on the ish. So eight exercises, call it 10 weeks. Yeah, sometimes I lose patience. So yeah, so the and and I hear you. So part of part of what I try to do is I try to give, you know, a certain amount of imagery, uh, you can kind of introduce it in kind of sneaky ways and not tell them exactly what you're doing. So they don't be like, I want to do Vibrato! And then they start just kind of start waggling all over the place. Um, so you can kind of be like, we're just going to start doing this in preparation for something. Uh, and some students will be like, in preparation for what? But some students will just be like, okay, I'm good. Um, so you, you kind of know your students. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it does take some patience. The, luckily, by exercise four, you are, you have, a, you have Vibrato. It's not at command, but you have vibrato. So by the way, one per week-ish is with the exception of the first two. The first two are 100% introducible right away. Maybe even the first three can be done in one lesson. So let's go ahead. The first one is, I call this you darn kids, bought a house this year, have a lawn. It's in lousy shape. I'm trying to figure out how to have it not be so lousy. I'm like planting grass seed. This is like, anyway, I'm pretty excited about this. But so if someone comes on my lawn, right? It's the you darn kids. There must be some of the Simpsons, right? So go ahead and show me this. You got your 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 kind of fist is facing yourself, and you're shaking it back and forth, saying you darn kids, I'll get you darn kids. right. Those darn kids. I don't have a sidewalk in front of my house. Sidewalks on the other side, so I don't have too many darn kids. Um, oh, we have one more question. You can drop it into the into the chat, and we'll and we'll grab it later. So we're doing this motion, and you want it. You know, it shouldn't be tiny. It should be fairly large, and fairly rapid, and fairly easy, right? This is a motion that's like. What, we're, we're taking lessons to learn to do this? No, we're actually not taking lessons to do this. That's the point. You already know this one, right? Yeah, we got all kinds of things. So the next thing you're gonna do is you're going to do that with your instrument on your shoulder. So let me just show you first. This is called polishing the string, not to be confused with polishing the string, which is, I don't know what that is, but polishing is spelled the same way. Recently was called to my attention. Um, so you're going to leave a finger down and you're gonna do the same motion. You can see this is really the same motion. Very frequently, I'm trying to see if anyone's doing this. Oh, you guys are so good. Okay, this is why I like teaching grown-ups. Um, very frequently what you'll have happen is you'll have some variety of this. And the reason why we went to do this first is because there's no inclination to do anything with your wrist. So go ahead and put your fiddles back down, or your 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 things back down. Um, sorry, if you're less, your you put you put your, your instruments back down and go ahead and shake shake at those kids again. Now bring the instrument back. Go ahead and do this. I want to tell you something we just did that's really, really important for any time you're working on something that's broken down into steps. The first step is super, super easy. Usually the first step should be super, super easy. The second step may be easy. The third step may be easy, but always in an inter incremental progression, you will always encounter a step that is your challenge. This is the challenging step for you. So let's say maybe the fourth step is challenging for you. You always want to go back to three and toggle back and forth between three and four. Don't just hammer away at four. Because remember, this first step, this was easy. If someone has trouble then with this, you say, well, hold on a second. You know how to do this. Go ahead and go back and forth between this and this. And then you actually take something you already know and add a teensy weensy complexifier, and then they're able to do something new, but it's not that new. In the same way that if I wanted to learn something in sports, I'm not a super sportsy guy, I would start by like running. You know, if you want to run and throw a baseball, you start by running, right? And making sure the running's in good shape. 
running, I can do that. I'm still kind of youngish, so it's fine-ish. Running is pretty good. I would then throw the baseball. That's probably good too. Then I can run and throw the baseball, and that might be difficult. But if I'm having a, tr- a struggle there, run, baseball, run, throw baseball. Run, baseball, do it together. Because then you're reinforcing the things you already know. So as we go through, I'm going to do a lot of toggling back and forth, assuming that you're having a challenge with this stage. This next one now is exactly the same as polishing the string, but we're introducing the independence of the right hand. Let me show you first. This one's called Ghosts or Sirens. It's not Halloween-ish, but we'll go with Ghosts anyway. You pull the bow along the string slowly and continuously, and the hand is just going to polish. Oh, I should mention this, by the way. We're at harmonic pressure. So my finger's on the string, but there's no pressing. I don't want any of this. None of that whatsoever. Harmonic pressure, that's why it's ghosts. Go ahead and try this. Most people want to do this. There's a difficulty. No, you guys are good, though. Already. Having the right and left hands independent. It's a challenge. And as you have your super duper expensive fancy mirrors, right? I have mine too. Um, go ahead and check out to make sure that there's not a whole lot of breaking going on in the wrist, right? Not a whole lot of anything like this. Because if there is, we're going to go back to this and back to this. But from what I see from the group, from those I see, this is looking pretty, pretty solid. The next step, and this is the biggest one for the, uh, who is it, Marie who asked the... Yes, for Marie who asked the kind of pedagogy step. Step four is the big one that you cannot progress through until it's well done. So this is called shrinking ghosts. So now it's like a Ghostbuster situation. We caught the ghost, and we're kind of shrinking it down to a small size. So within a single bow, we're going to take this ghost and make it smaller and smaller until it's, until it's kind of in one spot. I naturally kind of gravitate towards a tiny bit more pressure, but I'm almost still at harmonic pressure. Go ahead and try this out. This is the, probably the most challenging one. Step. Let's have a look. I want to see, see, what, see what's going on. That looks excellent, Gloria. Probably could do vibrato already, though. <laughs> no? Oh, well, it, it look, from what I can see, it looks good. One of the great things about the violin Violin. My wife's a clarinet player. You can't see anything, right? It's like, well, that looks like someone playing clarinet with the violin. It's like, that was good. That was bad. That was good. Perfect. Fix this. I can tell you so much from looking. So go ahead and do this for one more second. And if you're having trouble with it, go back to these big ghosts. And then shrink them down. And by the way, you'll notice I'm kind of landing somewhere around second position. Intonation of the pitch is the farthest thing from our mind right now. I could not care if it's in tune or not. We're not even aiming for a particular pitch. This is something also that you very, when you're learning a new technique that's a little bit unnatural. This is unnatural, by the way. It doesn't have to be uncomfortable, but it's not natural in the sense that, you know, babies come out and have a three-month-old son. You give him a pencil, he can kind of grab the pencil like this. That's a natural thing. This sort of thing, super duper natural. This, eh, not natural can be very, very comfortable, can start to feel like your natural voice, but it's not something that people would naturally be able to do. Okay, let's, so once you have Shrinking Ghosts going well, how are people feeling about Shrinking Ghosts? Can I have a thumbs up for, for feeling pretty okay about Shrinking Ghosts? That's a lot of thumbs. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and do a single note with no ghost preparation. So you place a finger down, you bow, and there's vibrato. But the critical thing is it needs to feel like what it felt like here, which is, by the way, does anybody at the end of Shrinking Ghosts feel any hint of tension? Don't nod your hands, <laughs> shake it. No, no, Dr. Herzog, no tension whatsoever. Good, right? Nobody feels any tension. That's the point. The point is that we've taken a motion that's tension-free, 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 tension-free. Woo, tension-free vibrato. Holy smokes, check it out, right? Yeah, but can you turn it on like a light? Not right now. If you're already doing vibrato, yes. But if you're someone who's really genuinely learning this for the first time, you cannot turn this on like a, like a light switch. Not yet. You have to do it over and over and over again until it becomes something that you can do naturally, like walking and chewing gum. Don't do it until you can walk and chew gum separately, right? Okay. So once you can do that, the next thing is to do just single notes. So put a finger down. My second finger is my happiest vibrato finger, so that's why I'm demonstrating a lot. And replicate that feeling. 
Let's go back and forth between shrinking ghosts and that. So shrink the ghost. And then just start from that feeling. And don't worry too much about what it sounds like. You can observe, but just observe and be like, oh, that's fascinating. Don't be too judgmental. We're all mostly very judgmental people. Sorry guys, me too. And we just, we listen to things come out of our instruments and we're so heartbroken that we don't sound as good as, you know, James Ennis and, and like Hilary Hahn. It's like, yeah, that's, that's life. Okay, she's, and he are just great. And I'm somewhere below that and that's okay, right? So shrink the ghost and then just start it out of the air with that same feeling. Yes, especially about ourselves. One of my favorite things to do with, um, do I, how many teachers, teachering people do I have out here? At least one, two, three, some, some, okay, a couple, some teachers out here. One of the things I love to do with my students is after they play, I, I do two and two. If, if I put up my fingers like this, they know exactly what they're into. into. I want to hear two things they're proud of and happy with and two things that they want to improve. Two of each, no more, no less. Man, the first time I do this with students, they usually look, they're like, things that are good. Ah. Uh, and they're like looking at their feet, like, I guess I'm wearing shoes. That's a start, right? And as they're like playing the Brahms violin concerto actually pretty well, right? And they can't think of anything good. So it's a very good habit to get into ourselves, to think about what's going well, actually. Um, after we're doing single notes, I really like to introduce continuous vibrato at this point. Continuous vibrato gets kind of like a scary rap. Continuous vibrato basically means I'm playing, moving from finger to finger. without interrupting this motion, right? Instead of... Oh, wow. <laughs> it's actually harder for me to do non-continuous. The idea of keeping it continuous... Oh, Barbara Concerto. Oh, boy. Okay, so that idea of continuous vibrato, and it is something that can be very daunting, but there is actually a preparatory exercise that almost everybody can do at this point. What you do is you put two fingers down and we're assuming that you have vibrato just coming out of the air. Two fingers go down, you vibrate, gently and tension free. And then in the middle of the bow, I'm just gonna let the third finger float off the string whenever it kind of has the inclination to do so. And usually, yeah, go ahead and try that. So you're gonna play this and just let the third finger just kind of peel away from the string as gently, if it's a little kind of dirty on the, in the sound, perfectly fine. Just allow your hand to rock and then just the third finger just kind of floats away. Let's get a look at some of some of you guys doing that. I'll see if I can give any feedback to where we are. Go ahead, Miriam, give it a shot. Are you taking notes? People are, people, I see people going back and toggling with, with exercises, that's excellent. Yeah, so if, you, if, you're not, if you don't quite have a vibrato at this point, then this might be a little, little bit of a, of a leap. But once you have that solid vibrato, you can even try, try it this way. We can kind of do a proto, a proto version, which is you're wiggling your hand. We can do, you know, you darn kids. And as you're doing that, just let your first finger kind of go up and say, you guys are number one. <laughs> this is a brand new exercise for this class, hot off the presses. And you just kind of allow, as you're doing that, the first finger just kind of comes up. Right? And that's a motion. You are now pairing two different things, right? Which is this way and this way, which our brains hate that. Our brains hate that. We have to do it, right? It's this, oh, um, it's this all over again, right? We can all do this. Can you switch and go back and forth seamlessly? Believe it or not, I've practiced this in the sense that I've done it at some point in my life for like five minutes and learned how to do it. That's very, very difficult to do unless you've done it. This with lifting and dropping is very difficult to do unless you've done it and then it becomes something your body knows how to do. So that's the kind of continuous vibrato with pairs of fingers. And then once you have some of that coming, step seven is simple tunes. So uh, I think I have a list of, where's my list? Ah, I have Twinkle, Merry Head Little Lamb, and Amazing Grace. Who knows what? Um, can I see a one? Uh, we gotta, we're gonna vote on which one you wanna do. Amazing Grace is maybe a little harder. So we're gonna choose between Twinkle, and Merry Head Little Lamb. Which one would you like to try first, Twinkle or Mary? Show me your votes. Oh, we got, Mary. oh, a little bit of Twinkle here. Looks like the Marys have it. I hate it when it's a close vote. This is not so close, good. It's Mary. So we're gonna go good old fashioned on the D string, 
maybe on the A string viols, you can play on a D string, violins, you can play on the A string. We can't hear it anyway, so it doesn't matter. And you're gonna play nice and slow. And just see, let's just do those first three notes, which also are the first three notes of hot cross buttons, right? But anyway, that's a different point. Let's see if you can get that slight wiggle, that tension-free feeling on the first three notes. The third note's free because it's an open string, right? So let's go ahead. If that's challenging for you right now, let's go ahead and shrink some ghosts. Let's do second finger on the A string because we're going to need it in a second. And now go straight into Mary. I'm sorry, I made a, I made a misstep here. As you are shrinking the ghost and then you arrive at this tension-free feeling, your brain needs to be in your arm saying, what do you feel like? What do you feel like? And then, what does that feel like? It feels like this. I'm going to do that again. Then you push your brain back in that arm and you try to recreate that exact feeling. Let's try that. What does that feel like? Do it again. Now, see if you can do a second note. See if you can re recreate that exact feeling. Because right? in the end, it's all about feelings. I notice that I don't see a lot of tapes on violins, right? How do you know where to put your fingers? Man, right? That's what all the friends ask. They're like, where, where are the frets? How do you know where the notes go? Well, the answer is, it's a com if you plug and stuff my ears up, it's not going to be good. But it's, so it's a combination of using our ears, but how do you play fast? You just, you just know how it feels. The violin and string instruments are super, super touchy-feely. We do a lot of touching and feeling. That's how we know how to do things. So you're feeling what this feels like in your arm, and you're replicating that feeling inside the tune. Um, and I love simple tunes because there's no pressure, right? You all know how to play Mary Had a Little Lamb, and if it sounds bad, nobody cares. It's Mary. Um, yeah, I've done terrible things to Mary Had a Little Lamb over the course of my career. Um, and then the last step, which is step eight, is just doing it in your current repertoire. Usually you don't want to like just kind of go full throttle, let's vibrate every single note all the time. Um, you know, if you're playing, um, I'm trying to think what's a nice kind of book three sort of piece, humoresque. There. And nothing else, right? So you say, that's the note I'm going to vibrate on right there. And you put a little heart sticker over it or something like that, or a little smiley face. There's your note for vibrato. And you just turn on your mind. What does that feel like? By this point, you've done these exercises quite a bit. They take repetition. Best thing is to do a couple minutes in the morning, a couple minutes in the evening. Your body will learn. Um, and then you just kind of turn that feeling on in that one spot. And then you just let the rest of it. And then you just let the rest of it be. Gradually, gradually, you start doing more vibrato in more places as well. Okay, um, let me just check my general tips section. Good, good, fine, covered that. Good, very well. Questions? Oh, I'm sorry, I should probably check the chat where all the questions are. <laughs> right, uh, basses and celli. In solo music that has fast notes and difficult string crossings. Uh, so, Vidya, that's, you mean in terms of, uh, Vidya asks, what is the best way to approach a section in solo music that has fast notes and difficult string crossings? Um, in terms of vibrato? Because usually fast, fast notes and string crossings were, hmm? I mean, just in general. Uh, that's a whole separate class. <laughs> there's, there, I mean, there's lots and lots of things, of course. <laughs> Can I jump in and you know what? Can we answer that at the very end, sweetie? Yes, so that the, the other people can go off, but we'll come back to it. Fantastic. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Sound good, Vidya? Oh, yeah. Okay. You, you said that actually. And then Marie, are there any, uh, is, is there any particular moment where the movement shifts from arm to wrist? So in the end, you want to have a non-stiff wrist, non-excessive tension. I use arm vibrato. That's what I was taught. I can do wrist vibrato. Wrist vibrato is a bit of a different pedagogy because it comes from here. Usually you start vibrating here. You kind of do it like some sort of a, a flap and then you do it here. You do it here with the finger on the string and then you do it down here with the finger on the string, which I can only sort of half do. 
Um, that's more that this is a really kind of a separate pedagogy from wrist. Although as I'm vibrating, my wrist is slightly flexing, but that's just because I don't have excessive tension. Um, but uh, person running 16, yeah, video we'll talk about it later. Mary's habit. Remind us again how long we might take to get from step one to step eight. Um, so if you are working, I, the idea of one per week, I think is a very reasonable thing. If those first three, I think for a lot of people here, the first three were really easy, right? The shaking, the ghosts, and the ghosts while moving. And then suddenly when we got to the fourth, it was like, whoa, now it's a bit real. And the fifth one, where we're playing it out of the air, is like, mm -mm, I'm out. So then you're going to start, you know, and then you want to, if that's you, you want to do that fourth, the shrinking ghost exercise very consistently for a week. When I say very consistently, I mean like two minutes in the morning, two minutes in the evening, every day of the week with maybe one day off. Total of, that would be 24 minutes, right? If you try to do it 24 minutes in a row, two things will happen. It won't work and you will go crazy. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> Don't do those things. Um, the, the body learns much, much better spaced out over time. Um, yes, Any anybody else got... um. Something for me before I move on? All right, that kind of, this concludes this. this now we're gonna get into some more like slightly exciting things. Um, I'm actually going to skip. I was gonna work on a piece with vibrato with you folks, but we already did a little of Mary. I think if we have time, we'll come back to Mary. I wrote out somewhere over the rest. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a place that I heard of once in a lullaby. My like, all time favorite song. Anybody else? Somewhere over the rainbow. Is at least does it at least crack your top like twenty five? Okay, it's like my like top number. Oh, I love it. Anyway, fine. Um, I was gonna work on that, but maybe we'll come back to Mary because if unless the vibrato, the, the kind of the basics are there, working on it in somewhere over the rainbow is gonna be not helpful. What I want to talk about now is when we're kind of exiting the point of you have a stable, nice simple vibrato. Anyone would listen and be like, that there's a vibrato. Once you have that kind of on your command, then you want to start moving towards something a lot more expressive and unique. And I want to play for you a little, little bit of myself, because I know the spot where I'm doing this, playing, this is the last statement of the tune from the second movement from Brahms' second violin sonata. Oh, too many words. Um, and it's very, it's, this is a tune we've heard several times at this point. It's very, very expressive. It's like the climax of the movement. I love it. And what I want you to listen to is the fact that my, oh, I'm sorry, we talked about this. Right, if I'm going to do vibrato, sorry, and I'm going to do regular old vibrato. What could I do to change the sound of that vibrato? Never mind how I would do it mechanically. What could I do to change that? What, what could I change? For example, with the bow, I can change bow speed. I can change bow pressure, bow weight. And I can change the sound point, right? Versus those are kind of our three elements that we can, you know, our three sliding scales that we can change to make things sound differently. Of course, if you do the wrong one, you get you get this or or that. Um, what do I do with vibrato? So I have a specific sound. Drop it in the chat. What can I change to make it different? in terms of sound. Speed, excellent reading, yeah. So I can play middle, I can play faster, slower. What's the other thing? That's, there's, there's only two. One is speed, pitch, yeah, wider, yeah. So Bernard Bern kind of had it and Karen's like the alley, oop, it's width. So I can do the same speed and go wider and narrower to the point of being almost not there at all, but still there. Um, so what I want you to listen to as you listen to this small excerpt here is I do a lot of varying. This is one of the, I don't do this a lot deliberately in my playing. I really, really vary the width and speed in, in parts of this for specific reasons. Go ahead and take a listen to this. Um, and give me a little thumbs up that th the sound is, whoa, the sound is not gonna work because I didn't ask it to work. Let me just make sure I click that box. That's the box, okay. How give me a thumb, thumbs up if the sound's gonna work?
Yeah. Do we hear it? We hear it? I give myself an 8.5 out of 10. Should have been slower at the end, but I was nervous. Fine. Sorry. Um, so what I'm doing, I want to talk through briefly with you what I'm doing and then how we can work on it. So in order to create excitement or energy, I increase the speed. This is very calm at the beginning, so I'm vibrating very slowly. And then, as the piano starts to play more harmonically interesting, speed it up a little bit. So it's faster. Slow it down again, and then really speed. And I'm actually pretty narrow here as, here as well. Because it's the, it's the best note in the whole darn piece. So I'm like letting you know, I'm like, you know where we're going? We're going oh, there, right? So that's, and, and I'm, I'm telling you that before I go, and of course you can listen to the piano as well, but I'm supporting that increase in harmonic tension in the piano by increasing the tension, not tension, not actually tension, ah, not actually tension, delete, delete, the excitement, there we go, in my vibrato, right? So the way that you can work on this, and a lot of people have words like excited, uh, broad, um, I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm a kind of a food person, so I have like, you know, my chocolate vibrato and like my, you know, my sprinkles vibrato and, <laughs> and that sort of a thing. Anybody else like food people? And people are like, you should play that louder. I'm like, what do you mean? You should play it more like chocolate. Gotcha. Right? Who are my food people? We got food people, food music people. I'm a food music person all the way. Um, so, <clears throat> but beyond that, when we're talking about actually working, working, working on how to do this mechanically, I'm going to show you a blank screen here because I'm going to just kind of start drawing. Um, let me show you a blank screen. Good. I'm going to use this in my drawing pad. So we can think of this as a chart and you'll, you'll forgive me for my drawing skills. Although because we're in the computer, it's at least going to be reasonably neat. So we got here a chart or a grid, I suppose, really. It's going to be a tic-tac-toe grid. And along one axis, we can put width. The other axis, we can put speed. Right? So, and then it, what we're going to do is we're going to have this be, oops, wrong, do that. There we go. Have this narrow. This is going to be medium. This is going to be wide. Hello. Right? That's the widths. And then for the speeds, we're going to have this, slow, this be slow, medium, and fast. And you can see that we're going to have, sorry, it's a little bit difficult. We can see that we're going to have nine different vibratos. We're going to have slow and narrow, slow and medium, slow and wide, medium speed, medium and narrow. Let us say medium narrow, medium medium, medium wide, fast and narrow, fast and medium, fast and wide. We all see that works. It's actually harder to say, I think, than to actually execute. So let me just show you how, through how you can go through this. You take a signal note. This is once we have a tension free vibrato on command. Before that, this is not this is not the exercise. We're going to do slow and narrow. I'll keep it. Um, I'll keep it um, slow the whole way, slow and medium, and slow and wide. You can hear that that's three distinctly different vibratos. All of them have a slow speed. Medium and narrow. Uh, let me think, think before I do it. Okay. No, that's not possible. Yes, yeah, medium speed, narrow width. Medium, medium. Medium and wide. Okay, we'll go fast and narrow, or kind of the quintessentially nervous, nervous vibrato. Fast and medium. And fast and wide. And the one kind of um, caveat I always tell people when, to do, when they're doing this exercise, they all have to be real vibratos. I can play a slow, wide vibrato like this. That's not a real vibrato. I ain't using that ever. It doesn't sound good. Um, so it should all be good. And you'll notice on your handouts, by the way, I call this Perlman permutations. That's because a friend of mine heard it from Perlman to do this. So it's, it's my Perlman approved exercise, except I've got a three by three grid here. Perlman says you should do seven by seven. And 
I, ain't nobody got paid. <laughs> ain't nobody got time for that. Are you kidding me? But the idea, what his idea is, if you can actually, what you'll usually find when you do this is you'll have a whole bunch of vibratos that are basically the same, and then one or two that are different. You want to have all nine of them be really different. And then if you're really patient, go to a four by four, and you want 16 vibratos that are really different. Like if I said, you know, Anna, what vibrato am I doing? You should be like, oh, that's medium and fat. That's medium and wide. You know, she should be able to tell like that. If you can't do that, it's not really right. All right? So that's kind of that more advanced one. And then as you're interpreting your music, you choose what you want to do where. I'll play you a little bit of Thais meditation again because that's what we started with, and we'll kind of bookend with that, and then we'll take some more questions. This piece, if we're going to come up with words, I'm a very, words, food, etc. this is calm, it's elegant, ethereal. The vibrato at the beginning should not be, right? It should be, let's go maybe like medium, medium, medium. Just gorgeous, but very kind of relaxed. But now we're going to the top of the phrase. So I'm going to actually increase speed a little bit. I'll go at the beginning. Relax it back. This is the lowest emotional point. Right, I'm really slow here. I'm slow and wide though, because it's broad and beautiful. Speeding up. Right, and you can hear. So a word to the to people who are going, oh my God, does he actually think this way? Not really, no. Um, it becomes a bit like, yeah, if you're trying to walk and balance, right? And you're sitting there like, left shoulder up, left shoulder down. No, 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 no. You just do it and you, you just balance. You, you feel the response from your body. You desire to have it go this way and you do that. In the same way, maybe I have a better analogy. In the same way that if I'm walking, I say, I'm going to go left. I'm not thinking about the mechanics of going left. I'm just, I'm just turning left, right? So for me, I'm thinking, I want, I want more here. And the, le and the left hand goes, all right, I got you back. And it starts to do that. However, there are certain passages like the Brahms I play for you where I really deliberately do plan it out because they're just so special. I want it to be right every time and I don't want to trust that instinctually it's just all going to fall into place. So I want to really, really, really get them right every single time. The Thais, it's going to be different every single time depending on what I feel like. Um, but that Brahms moment is always the same because I think that's just the way to play it and I just want it that way every time. So I practiced it and I thought about it. Uh, but in general, I'm not really thinking this way. Yes. So let me just give a little summary and I'm going to look at the chat for questions and then we'll kind of we'll kind of close up. Everything that I'm telling you now, which is kind of, eh, it's a little bit off in the sky for, you know, it's a little bit off in the sky, let's face it. Um, all of that is based on the foundation of this motion, which is tension free, of having this knuckle being free enough to actually move back and forth. Because without those things, I basically have nothing. Uh, I, I have nothing at all. Then as, that be, as you go through those eight steps of exercises and you're able to produce that sensation, which produces a sound, of course, that we like, consistently, on command, tension-free, then we start to say, okay, now what do I wanna do that's a little bit more? And the first time you try these different types of vibrato, you're gonna probably discover that you're, you don't physically know how to do it. You're gonna get some really silly sounds like, you're gonna get some really wacko stuff in there. And you will say, well, not really like that so much. Let's try something else. There's a lot of experimenting and kind of thoughtful work that has to happen and curiosity. Oh, that's the name of the classes. Yes, we're curious, right? There's a lot of curiosity that has to happen about like, well, you know, I, I was sitting around like, what can I do to make this note just make my heart go like that? And like, oh, when I do that with the bra, that's so cool. And that's why I do it there. And now it's something I, I also apply elsewhere in my music making. Um, but a lot of that comes from experimentation. Experimentation built on that solid, solid foundation. All right, I'm gonna, is it okay to switch over to questions? Okay, excellent. I can't even do vibrato. Um, if you do the exercises, you will. Um, that's the uh, Isla, Ayla? Ayla? Yes, awesome. Uh, Miriam also is not happy doing vibrato. Okay, you're talking to each other. Um, Videos on fundamentals. 
Marie is asking, is it accurate to say that a slow, wide vibrato should be used on lower pitches and a fast, narrow vibrato on higher pitches? Generally, yes. Uh, with massive, m mucho exceptions. Um, the, the widest vibrato we usually use are, are, you know, the kind of... That kind of, those, those super like... To the top of the world on the on the G string. That's when because if you do that vibrato up here, you know, in like I don't know, beginning of Mendelssohn's show. <laughs> just, I can't even do it. It sounds like I've had a couple of drinks too many, and it's just time to call it a night, you know. But uh, but up on the you know or in uh, in um, just a Bailey singing. <laughs> Really wide vibrato. I love the sound of that. That is that's an insane for for on the E string anywhere. That would just be awful. So yes, yes. Question. I just want to say really quickly. I hope everyone noticed when you just did that note though. It wasn't just a really wide vibrato. It was this stunning from almost nothing. Yeah. Who it was yeah. gorgeous. <laughs> that's that's another special special technique. I, in my family, we call that the Dupre vibrato because I think the first person that my family heard do that was Jacqueline Dupre, and so we just call it the Dupre thing. Um, yeah. Uh, do you, you know? And to, yeah. Um, um, can I just jump in really quickly? And I want to pull our cellos and bassists into this conversation. So every single thing he has done works great for us. All we're doing is changing the angles. Yeah. You're shaking, you're shaking the soda can, right? Don't actually shake it. The thing you're never supposed to do, start there. Yeah. Exactly. Count on something. And oh, okay. That's good. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, and for my bass players especially, you know, Gary Carr was the one that came along and really made it common to do all these different kinds of vibrato on the bass. Because he would go really high, to Marie's question, he would go really high on the bass and do this wide vibrato when everybody was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. It was so weird. And he actually broke all the rules and made it stunning. And so bass players, you should also do your grid and go through and work on all those different. I'm done. Thank you. If you want to get fancy with the with the grid as well, you can play like a scale or something. Part of my teaching as well, I, I just, I assume people are generally impatient because I'm just not that patient myself. And to say like, you should play an entire piece with each vibrato style, it's just like, ugh, just go away. I'm just not. I'm just. I'm just not going to do that. And so I kind of assume you're not. If you're like super able to do that, and you just have like a brain the size of a football, by all means, it's going to be great. But I just, I just can't. I just can't do that. Um, I don't have patience. Um, any other questions to drop in the chat? Maybe we can kind of broaden if you want a little bit away from from vibrato. And actually, because somebody else asked me privately, um, but um, video was asking about fourth finger because it's diff more difficult yes fourth finger is a drag um <laughs> i don't know what to tell you um generally speaking a lot of the troubles we find with our fourth finger vibrato and otherwise are because we play we how many people started in some sort of suzuki situation some sort of suzuki situation use the suzuki books Ooh, not so much good for well oh well, okay we've got more hands there the way the suzuki repertoire is designed you'll notice you're starting you know or even better if you start across bounds. So we spend all our time, you know, setting up our hand. And like, okay, here we go. You're in first position, slide on the magic X, tap over here if you're doing Mimi's Y. Great, and you're nice in here, and then. Yay, first finger, fantastic. Pretty good. Whoa, hold on a second, that's actually pretty far. And then five months later, someone says, now we're gonna use your fourth finger. And the student's like, ah, uh, what? Excuse me, like, um, it's too short. It's my fourth finger for this hand setup is actually too short to reach. Okay, it's not out though. I can reach the A string. I'm a big guy. I'm 6'2 over here. I mean, like, you know how you're supposed to size on the violin? The violin's supposed to reach your wrist like that? I mean, look at this. I'm too big. I'm a violist. I actually love playing the viola, but I am a better violinist than violist. I'm too big for the violin. I have really big hands. That's ridiculous. I almost can't play the fourth finger. Right? Okay, so, hello. So the, pro the, tr the trouble is, if, if you're setting up really, really centered on that first finger, it's great for the beginning because let's face it, you get quick results. 
I don't have any problems with it. But at a certain point, you got to tell you soon, this thumb, it can't go here. It's got to go you know, like there. And your hand, it can't be set up like this. You've got to rotate a little bit towards the violin. So what I usually do for this, and we can try this, you can go ahead, for anybody who's not 100% happy with the fourth finger, I would include myself in that crowd, take your, mat, your, your shrinking ghost, and let's shrink some ghosts on the fourth finger. And I want you to keep your hand, your left hand, totally tension-free, but I do want you to arrive on the fourth finger note. So if it's a violin, we're gonna have that E on the A string. Let me just demonstrate that first. And the hand should be totally tension-free. Go ahead. And find where you arrive on that fourth finger. We got a couple people doing this. Yeah, we'll let it. And what I want you to look at, and no, no wild vibratos, video, take it easy with the vibratos. We're not looking for vibrato, we're looking for a hand position. If your hand is completely relaxed, where does it land? And I gotta show you, my thumb's here. Look where my thumb is, people. It's like halfway between the scroll and the, and the body. Not quite, but maybe a third. And my first finger is next to my thumb, indeed. But it's, my hand is, is spaced by semitones, right? Go ahead and try that. And I think that is usually where people's hands land most comfortably. We're gonna work on how to actually play the violin in a second. Even if you don't want to vibrate the last, let's actually stop without vibrato. And just kind of stop there. And notice where your hand is. The fingers are probably pretty close together. And your thumb is probably kind of around your first finger, right? Nodding and, nodding and smiling, if that's correct. From there, I'm gonna, oh, and your fourth finger is like, look at the curvature here. Oy, 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 is that ever beautiful. Isn't that nice? Do you also have beautiful curvy fourth fingers that never look that way ever otherwise? Right, so go ahead and if you want to take the bow out of it, that's great too. Take the bow out, just back and forth saying, oh, be comfortable hand, be as comfortable as you possibly can. Where would you be if you were asleep? And then that's where you're gonna be from there. I use my eyes because they're a very important tool for focus. I'm gonna keep my eyes on the fourth finger and the thumb and say, you guys don't go anywhere. Everybody else, back up a little bit. And your first finger is going to be like, excuse me, this is hard. What the heck? Your second finger is like, I can do this and third finger is fine. The, you might get some protests from your first finger, first finger saying, this is not the usual deal. I usually am much more comfortable than this, right? Everyone's first finger is a little less comfortable than usual. And you know what you tell your first finger? Suck it up, bud. You're strong. The fourth finger needs us, right? So we set up the hand. <laughs> Sorry, we set up the hand. Oh, that's really mean. Uh, we set up the hand. You say it nicely. Um, you set up your hand so it's super comfortable for the fourth finger, and then you open the hand up a little bit. Thumb might change a little bit so that the rest of your fingers are a little bit, little bit, not quite super comfortable. But the fourth finger feels great. And then you play like that. And then, my fourth finger looks great. My first finger is fine. It'll survive. And then when I'm doing vibrato, I'm starting with this curly fourth finger that actually stands a chance. Whereas if you set up in this hand position, and your fourth finger is like this, I, I don't know how to help you. I don't, I can't, I mean, I do, but it's doing what we just did. It's not a vibrato problem. It's a hand position problem. Um, yes? Yeah, it's, it's in tune when you're comfortable, right? So the point is you get your fourth finger there, and then the rest of your hand has to work on being more comfortable. I love Shraddock. Everybody knows Shraddock number one? That old earworm? <laughs> oh, not really. Uh, I'll write that down in the chat. What that is? Stratic. School of Violin Techniques? Or something like that? Book one, number one. Um, and it's transcribed for viola as well. Probably other instruments also. And right at the bottom of the page, he says, loosely paraphrasing, the pupil should ensure that the fingers fall um, with nice sound, nice, um, lots of percussiveness and rise elastically and that the hand remain quiet throughout all the exercises. And I, oh, yes, it is 100% on MSLP. Yes. And I always have people asking, what does it mean to have the hand? Well, actually they don't ask. I ask, what does it mean to have the hand quiet? It means that when you're playing this, your hand from here down should look like this. Right? Not like this nothing and if your hand ha and i'm not saying that you should be tense and stiff to do that i'm saying that if your hand needs to do that to get your fourth finger down 
you have a hand position problem. Something needs to be changed. By the way, we all have a hand position problem. My hand position is not perfect either, right? Fine, I'm still working on it. But you need to, that is like one of the first steps. If you see this moving to get your fourth finger down, something is not right about the way you're not in a balanced hand position. That was one of the first check boxes on that, that pre-fight checklist. Your hand should be balanced. And balanced, for, I guess I should explain that, for me means there's an equal, kind of equal weight between the first and fourth finger, not first finger is everything and the fourth finger is kind of like, you're on your own, buddy. Okay, let me see what else. Not calling out Marie, I love Marie, I love Mimi. Marie, I love Mimi. Mimi is like my, she's like, I took like classes with her when I was like a wee little and, and I was like, oh, oh, she's so great. And I still kind of basically feel that way. Um, so fourth fingers in two minutes comfortable. Yes, sir. Um, Crossman for Charlie bass. Thank you. I don't know. Or Charlie, yeah. How to match your vibrato to the musical style genre you're playing. Oof. Big question. Oh, big question. Um, one of the most interesting historical things to know, one of the last violinists to, um, to kind of be cranky about this and, and insist that not every note should be vibrated. One of the last violinists to say not every note should be vibrated was Josef Joachim, who is not that far into history. A, B, which most famous concerto was written for him? Oh my goodness, it was the Brahms. That means Brahms liked Joachim's violin playing, which means Brahms probably liked hearing his concertos without vibrato on every possible note. That should blow your mind. If not, go listen to Brahms' concerto and it's like, everything's vibrato. And I don't think you should change it. But we have to acknowledge that this idea of vibrato being, I mean, when you hear me playing Menace Thais, every note's got vibrato. Every note's got vibrato. Even the kind of fast little note's got like one and a half a wiggle at least. Everything's vibrating and we love it and I wouldn't change it. However, historically speaking, nope, that's wrong. <laughs> so, um, and this is, you know, it's the same question with Bach. You know, I'm playing on this instrument uh, with this bow and I, that, so that being said, it doesn't mean that we just kind of play, you know, we don't play, you know, I don't play Bach like a... <laughs> No, 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 no. Okay, fine, fine. You want to go back to 1940? Go nuts. That We don't really play that way anymore. And the reason why is that we've kind of become informed of what was stylistically appropriate. Again, I am playing on a modern instrument. I like my modern instrument. Mm, I love this instrument. And I like the way it sounds. I have played on Baroque instruments, and so I'm going to inform that. <laughs> dancing style, fast tempo, quite dancey. I love that piece. That's the, the jig from uh, from the second partita. But it's still on a modern instrument. I'm doing things that would not really work on a Baroque instrument. Okay, tangent, 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 back to the subject. Vibrato, in terms of styles, so when you're playing, you know, like the, the oldest music that I play is, is the Bieber Pascalia. If you don't know it, let me type it into the message here. Bieber Pascalia. I have a recording of it on YouTube. Um, by the way, if you want to find me on YouTube, search William Herzog Violin. That's me. Um, and it's, you know, Pascalia is a dance with a the same bass line over and over again. And I personally like starting with no vibrato at all. There's your bass line. There's the first bars. You'll hear as that top voice enters, I give it a little something special. I, because I think that's expressive. And that is appropriate. Bieber, by the way, uh, this piece was written the year Bach was born. So it's old. It's old stuff. So I, which is 1685. I like doing, but I've heard people play it with much more vibrato and I don't mind. I don't mind that. Um, but you know, if you're playing Mozart, don't, you know, don't. It has to fit 
with what you're doing with your right hand. And if you're playing it like this, you know, there is a substantial oral tradition in, in music um, where we kind of know how it's supposed to sound because we know what people did before with us. And because music, there is no objective right answer, right? You can go in the band writer and say, well, Beethoven said it was supposed to be 120 to the metronome. No, forget about it. Don't tell me that that's objective. Beethoven's metronome may have been broken. And even if it wasn't, I don't like it. And I'm alive and he's dead. So, however, I do want to play his music and I should not, you know, completely disrespect his intentions. But it's, it's this balance. Um, I'm really not answering the question directly. Um, but the point is that you need to do something that's informed by what we know of how Mozart would have played things, but also speaks to you. And also, if you have a teacher, your teacher will say, that's really bad. And you should be like, okay, I'll do something different. But you know, start, choose what you like, informed by history, and then, and then make it your own special thing. And if people hate it, if they really hate it, and you really love it, nuts to them. Who are you playing for anyway? Um, and generally speaking, in my experience, if you really love it, some people are going to love it. Even if a lot of people, one of my favorite comments was after I played the Bach Con at Meadow Mount. I think it may have been the viola. So one, of, one of the other teachers came up and was like, you did some really interesting voicing. Because you can play, you know, when you're playing chords, you can go. Bottom to top, or not that I did it here, but. The point is you can you can voice sing backwards. You wouldn't do it that way. You can go or or and let's face it, you know what instrument Bach was hearing a lot of? It was the like plucked loody sort of things. And they went, they go and so the idea of playing a chord in Bach like that, that's not heinous at all. It's not done. But it's actually historically fairly reasonable. And I don't know if I can quite got to enough to tell my students to do it, but I might do it occasionally. You know, I'm getting older and people are kind of starting to like me more, so I can kind of just get away with a lot more stuff. And it's and I'm and it's historically defensible. So, you know, that was the longest non-answer to your question ever. Um, yeah, was that reason a reasonably satisfying answer? <laughs> yeah, it has to sound good, you know, as well. Anybody else thoughts about violin, vibrato? Maybe not quite general life questions, but. So if you have some, and some more questions, please throw them in the chat. Um, since we do have a few extra minutes, William, um, do you mind touching on, um, Vidya had asked for um, some tips on just playing fast passages. Do you have a couple of those? Do you mind? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, and in general passage work a lot of it especially if it's a difficult passage is about having enough things to do that you don't go crazy um and get bored because if you you know everyone knows um let's do schumann's character right <laughs> So close. I have not practiced that for a long time, um, but I practiced it well because it's still in there. So that's a lot of notes. It's really brutal. It's just nasty. It's wormy. It stinks. It's Schumann. Love you, buddy. But we could have done without that one. Anyway, so how do you practice something like this? Most people are aware of rhythms. We know these rhythms. Nod your head for you. You know these rhythms. Yes. Good. You should totally do those. There's other rhythms as well, right? So that was a group of three. So I played one, two, three, four, five, six. Now go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Always when you're working like this, tension free. So that's that's called beat shifting. So you can take a pattern or a group and just beat shift it through. Oh boy, if you've got any any sort of creativity, you can do that. You can that you can be doing that all day. There's virtually you can do groups of three, groups of four, two short, one long, two short, one long, and just shift it along the beat. You are good for hours. Um, but if you want more, um, I really like um, this is stolen from do I have Kreutzer on my desk? I do, of course. Um, this is stolen from the Colombian Kreutzer. 
Kreutzer 2, right? So he likes to, buried in the million Boeings that Galamian gives us, um, what are the numbers here? Oh, I don't even know. Five, anyway, I'll, I'll play it for you. You can break it up into groups of four. Let me, let me screen share this with you. Because this is actually my, kind of my first, my first, the first thing I do in my arsenal here, is I will take groups of four, and let's do this. Slow the first two, make the second two separate. First two separate, second two slurred. First separate, second and third slurred. Four and one slurred. Right, so this is boy number one, two, three, four. Now I'm gonna play the Schumann this way. So I'm gonna do in groups of four. Da da ba ba be da ba ba. So should I do maybe the, the Vivaldi concerto? Oh, I don't I don't know the passage working that up by heart. I'm not gonna try. Go to boy number two. Three. Oh boy, four is the one I need to practice. Oh boy. Uh, and you'll find usually that one of them's really, really hard. What this does is it calls to attention any rhythmic inconsistencies or fingering incompetencies that we didn't notice. And it will just be like a spot. Like, like here's where the problem is. Um, and then you can, so these Boeings, these are my first, almost always the first thing that I do. People are not so familiar with those. You'll notice also through all of these, all of these methods, and there's, I'm sure there's a couple more. Um, there's a great book, by the way, called Practice by Simon Fisher, also on my desk, right? And he's got just pages. I actually have some extra things to say, and so I'm writing a paper about it. But he's got like, he's got so much good, so, so much good stuff in here. Um, you know, you don't have to be the person who comes up with it, but if you lay it out, oh yes, Eric. But if you lay it out in a nice, clear form that I can just reference. Oh man, I'm buying that book. Um, so that's, you know, there's, there's great resources on that. In everything I'm doing, you'll notice I am starting under tempo and building up tempo, right? That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is playing full tempo right away, but small bits, right? So with the Shivan, let's do four note groups. Idea is between each group. I'm thinking my break. Okay, C A F sharp flat. I'm thinking about the notes, kind of visualizing through how this is going to work. Um, I apologize. I don't remember the, the name of the wonderful lady who did the pre presentation on memory. And I bought that book. Woo! Is that a good book? Holy mackerel! Um, it's the, the Giza King book. It's like this big, and it's like it's like chewing on beef jerky. It's so dense, but lots of good stuff in there. So I'm after these four notes. I'm thinking through. What do I do next? What's going to happen? And then in a tension-free manner, I go for it. Did you notice that that note didn't sound? Okay, I need to maybe rotate my hand a little more. Let's try again. Oop, I squeaked and moved the bow too soon. Let's try again. Good. Again. Good. Again. Okay. Now let's do eight. I wasn't ready. Didn't think through enough. One more time. That was good. Right? So the advantage to this, to this, to this approach, you should do both the slow and increased tempo and the fast right away. The advantage is you will avoid s learning things slowly, right? Everyone's done this. You learn slow, start slow, increase the tempo, and you just reach a point where it just doesn't want to go any faster, right? No one's had this happen. Or just, uh, just doesn't. Well, I'm, and the answer, the reason why is because you're doing something that doesn't make sense technically. For example, oh, I was Marta. She was, oh, she was awesome. Um, you'll notice that, for example, I can play the Schumann Scherzo in this fashion at a medium tempo. Can anyone spot why this is not going to speed up well? Oh God, this is too fast. I'm using my first finger for every single note. You see that. I see that nobody would make that mistake, but we do little things like that when we're playing under tempo that just won't work at speed. And so if you play fast, small groups, you avoid making those because if I can't play these first four notes at this tempo, maybe there's a hand 
position problem. Maybe I don't know the distance and the spacing of the notes. You're going to discover that maybe you can't even play four notes of it at tempo. So what are you doing playing the whole thing under tempo and assuming that it's going to gradually crank up? Figure out those first four notes at tempo. And if you don't know how to do it and you're really having trouble, go ask a teacher. Go ask someone who's really good. And they'll look at you and be like, ah, it's the hand position or something like that. They'll be able to spot it, but you'll be able to, to diagnose real fast whether this is going to work. Instead of spending a month gradually notching it and just reaching that, that ceiling at 60% tempo that you just can't get over. So sprinkle in some of that fast but small bits type of practice. Also, I have um, a follow-up question to that. So how do you, so you're doing that um, Schumann piece earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that for the lower mm -hmm. notes, you had to go down to the G string instead mm -hmm. really quickly. So how yeah. do you do those uh, strings? talking about things, things like, um, uh... like this sort of situation. Yeah, really. Yeah, so that's that's and at this point actually, and I, I'm remiss because almost everything I've said so far is left hand centric, right? So what you're now encountering is a passage where the where the where the right hand is a challenge. That's a whole. That's a different kettle of fish. Mostly it's about working slow and increasing speed, but when you're working slow, this arm must be smooth as butter. So I'm gonna play this. Um, I'm trying to think of an actual passage that I can do for you. Um, that's in my brain. Um, the main, so the piece I'm working on right now is yeah. the Vivaldi first movement. Yeah, I don't remember the, I don't remember all of it. I don't have the music handy. Um, um just, mainly. Uh, ah, I got one. Um, how does the rest of the bar talk go? Ah, I got it. This is the, oh, sorry, Dvorak. It's one of the Dvorak romantic pieces, the second one. There we go. Um, it's in the middle of it, so I had to kind of, in my mind, go like on fast forward. And then I hit. So this passage causes a lot of trouble for students who are rather good. Usually what you see happening is the following. Watch my right arm. And then, and, and my right arm, I have tension from like here to here to here. Uh, it's a tense mess, right? The reason why is I haven't trained my right arm what to do. Ow, actually, dang, don't do that. Um, so what you have to do, take the left hand away and say, okay, these first four notes, it's actually, and suddenly your right arm is like, oh, that's actually easy. And then you play it a couple times slowly or kind of medium tempo, focusing on keeping this arm as smooth as possible. Smooth, smooth, smooth. Once you're happy, put your brain in your right arm. What does this feel like? Feels like that. Add the left hand back in, feeling the right arm. And suddenly you can see I'm a good violinist. This is much better than what I did for you at first, right? Now my hand knows what it's doing. Second group. So it's actually it's G A A E. Smooth. The two patterns together. Now watch me play it. And it's actually much easier, right? And as I mentioned, good violinist, playing this better now, right? Because my right arm knows what it's doing. I can just kind of say, be smooth. And it's kind of like, okay, because I've done it a lot, but there's no substitute for this kind of practice. If I was going to play that piece, that passage I would be working on. That passage, there's a little diddle at the end that's kind of challenging. I'll be working on those spots. Um, so if you're working on something that's specifically right hand challenging, take the left hand away and work on smoothness. What does it feel like? And then put the left hand back. It looks like Jeannie has a question with a hand up or is that an old hand? Maybe it's an old hand. Nope, old no. hand. Okay. All right. All right. Um, if anyone else has a quick question, throw it in. Um, so a couple of things I wanna make sure everyone knows. First of all, before we do end, which we're gonna do in a few minutes, Make sure you look at the chat and write down any names of, I tried to put pieces he mentioned, books he mentioned, um, and I, we shared his download um, several times. So make sure you get that. Um, oh, I did want to know, William, what kind of violin are you playing? Uh, it's a Scarampella workshop. It that sounds beautiful. It's even beautiful on Zoom and that's saying something. <laughs> Thank you. Know? you. Original <laughs> sound helps a lot. So, um, so 
if you came in after my introduction in the beginning, here's the thing you have to know. There was not five seconds of tonight's class that wasn't super chock full of information. So go back when I post when I post this on um, in our YouTube channel tomorrow, go back and listen, especially those of you guys that came in a few minutes late because those first few vibrato exercises are going to clear a lot of things up for you. Um, so um, that that rocked totally. I'm just saying. So everyone's muted, but you can all clap for him and show your hands. Also on his download, he was kind enough. He put his um, email address, I think, website. And um, so tell me, are they um, are they welcome to contact you? So this is actually an important note. I'm glad for the 23 people who are still here. People say this a lot, that they like being contacted. Let me tell you the honest truth. I've taught a lot of students. I've done a lot of sessions. I get very few emails from people who aren't my current students. So if you're inclined at all to be like, I want to like at least say like, wow, that was cool. Or like, could you just follow up on this? Actually do that because we don't, I don't receive that many emails like that. Maybe other people do, but you know, as a teacher, especially like you get an old student, if you ever want to like contact that old teacher and say, you know, I just thought of you because I was playing this thing, just do. So if you want to contact me, go ahead. I like those emails. I like, you know, the, especially we're in COVID, you know, um, we're getting there, we're getting there. But, you know, especially now, be in touch. It's even if it's not COVID, be in touch because it's, it's nice and it's nice to feel like a community. And sometime in the future, you know, you may see me and be like, I know that guy. He actually responds to his emails. That's great. Um, or he didn't respond to his emails. I'm sorry. I have little kids. Um, but definitely be in touch um, because, you know, it's always good to talk to fellow musicians. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, reminding to everybody next week, we have Lynn Hannings. Um, she is a bow maker. She was my very first bow restoration teacher. She's going to do a thing on bow making and conservation in the bow world. She's gonna give us a tour of her bow workshop, which this is really cool stuff. I learned from her for years and I never got to see her bow workshop. So that's next Thursday, same bat time, same bat channel. My older people will remember that. My younger people roll their eyes when I say that. So, um, so, and I just wanna say it one more time. Seriously, William, thank you. This was fantastic. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. All right, see you guys next week. If you need to hang out and ask me something, you can do that. Otherwise, I have to go get my dog. You know the drill. And I'm turning off the recording. Good night, y'all. I'll, I'll also hang around for a couple minutes.